Good afternoon and welcome. I am so pleased to be here with Jennifer Ely, who is my friend, and I've known you for so long, and I, we were just discussing that you were at the Winiski Valley Park District for 30 years. You've been retired for 10, and I can't remember where we met, but I, definitely you were involved with the Winiski Valley Park District. And you are a biologist and a natural resource planner. And so I just want to start with how you became interested in being a biologist. Did that start in college? At first, I thought, wow, I want to be a chemist. It's such a puzzle. And then I realized, my gosh, if I'm a chemist, I'm probably living in a larger town. And I want to live where I can find forests to walk in. And did you live in Vermont at the time? Or how did you get to Vermont? My parents, we, we lived overseas for seven years. They found their retirement home in Rupert, Vermont, and there was no turning back at that point. It was like, this is a good state. Were you, did you just fall in love with Vermont? Did you have that experience that people do when they come and it's, it's kind of all the angels and the lights and the sun? <laughs> that happened to me. <laughs> no, it, in Rupert, I really like the tone of the people and when I would go up to Burlington, when I went up to Burlington to school, I liked how people walked a lot and just thought of themselves as good environmentalists too, even way back then. Yeah, and then how did you evolve into natural resource planning? Was that another degree that you got? Or? That was a master's degree <clears throat> that I got while I was still working with the park district. And it just seemed like, well, I had two wonderful women teach me lessons about how to read the landscape. And so the natural resource planner seemed like a good segue after that. You're a much better planner if you know what you're planning, if you know it well. Tell me about those women. Well, one of them is Susan Morse. She's still very much working. She's the founder and science director and lead educator of Keeping Track. And she has an, ex an excellent website, by the way, Keeping Track does. She has trained thousands of volunteers in 12 states and four Canadian provinces. Participants in Sue's wildlife monitoring program are taught how to spot wildlife signs, including footprints and gait as well as evidence of behaviors particular to a species. And that's the, the classes I took centered on that. Her outdoor classes helped me learn how to read the in, landscape in terms of where wildlife preferred to live and take cover and raise their young. And then the second person that inspired me was Alicia Daniel. She also is still working. She's the founder of the Vermont Master Naturalist Program. Oh, like and Master Gardener, but Master Naturalist. Bingo. How amazing, I never knew. And she's a master at it, I'll tell you. She, she's taught just countless numbers of UBM students. A lost art you know, reading the landscape, a lot of people aren't doing that as well, the natural landscape. So UVM, to read Vermont's landscape, she reaches out to nature lovers in 18 towns across Vermont to help them build community, deepen their knowledge, and plug into local conservation efforts. As you're saying this, it just seems so big, the subject of the natural landscape, protecting the natural landscape and creating institutions that preserve what we love so much about Vermont and what's so necessary for the world to have. So the, just a little bit about the history of the Winiski Valley Park District. How did that get started? And were you the starter of it or had it no. existed just before you? Um, it existed before me and somebody up at UVM, Henry Farmer, was just promoting the idea of regional land protection because the animals don't know when they're wandering from one town to another. And he was, he was instrumental in lighting the fire under that idea. Um, initially, there were five towns that said, we're signing up to be part of this district. It's a district kind of like a school district. It's public and also regional. 
and then two more towns joined within several years because they could see they were going to they were going to get a good deal. And what kind of deal? What what's the deal for the municipalities that are part of the district? And just really, what's the mission of the Winooski Valley Park District? Well, our mission, its mission, is... Um, it will always be your mission. Yes, all right, I'm going to slip up there then, <laughs> <That's> okay. okay. <laughs> um, was to find parcels, land enough, so that you could have people peacefully coexist with wildlife. you got to have large, a large parcel. So um, what I was doing... Early on, they had a director who didn't stay very long, and then there was another director who was hired, who was a man, and uh, within six months of me, he, he hired me, and he said, I want you to be my secretary, and I said, well, if you can call me an administrative assistant, I'll do it. So, um, I'm going on a tangent. No, though. this okay. is really interesting, okay. actually. <laughs> so. Um, he was the director and I was the administrative assistant. And within six months of me taking minutes at the board meetings and everything, without any announcement, they switched our roles. So I was the director and the fellow was the administrative assistant, but they didn't switch our salary levels. <laughs> Which at that point I thought, that's fine. I'm, I'm at the top, things are gonna get better. And they did. So. At that time, um, it was really still a young organization. Yes. And had certain sets of parcels. I mean, did the towns come to the table and say, I'm putting this parcel in? Or did you have a master plan and say, here's the parcels we're after? How did this acquisition of parts of land to protect become part of the district? Well, we focused on parcels we already had. There were like five, maybe five parcels, maybe three. And whether we're the, they were big enough to support people and wildlife, so that became a priority, adding to them abutting properties to make them bigger. And were they around the Winooski River? Was that part of the idea? Yeah, at first it was all, it's got to be in the valley, Winooski River Valley, but they leaped away from that. Um, like Colchester Pond also is connected to Indianburg Reservoir, which drains a different way. So talk about those acquisitions under your leadership that were so important, like Colchester Pond. How, how did the district acquire that? Oh, it was so cool. Steve Libby, who later worked at the Vermont River Conservancy, introduced me to Colchester Pond. I didn't know it existed. And he introduced me to it by taking me to Indyburg Reservoir, and we walked through the woods to Colchester Pond. And he was saying, you know, your job is like the opposite of a developer. Instead of chopping things up, you're putting pieces back together and Colchester Pond's a great place for you to do that. And I just was sold on the idea. And who owned Colchester Pond? It was the Colchester Fire District number three. They thought it would be a, poten a potential um, drinking water source for the town of Colchester, but that became obsolete because they found another better thing. And so they, what did they do? Did they gift it to the district or yeah, sell it? Yeah, they said, we want to give this to you. And it also included 25 feet around it, a little buffer. And um, I kidded with them. I said, you just want to be able to fish at the pond, right? And they went, well, yeah. <laughs> so that flew along. That, and then once we had the pond, we could start getting land. Around? Around it. And, and hopefully the whole watershed. And talk more about some of those other acquisitions under your tenure. I think my favorite one was with this older couple. And um, Doug and Thelma Wright, they invited me to their farmhouse and just said, we want to donate 39 acres of our land. And it was with the watershed. It was shoreline right up to the split on the watershed. and. Um, we talked, and I'll just never forget, sitting in their kitchen where they were saying when they were much younger, they had a really simple footpath that they would walk to the pond from their house, and they just wanted to make sure that the woods stayed intact 
and the land was never developed. Mm. Yeah, and they were so much in love. That was the thing. They just, they were agreeing on everything in a very sweet way. So are, do you, would you say that most of the contributions to the park district were given out of this spirit of love for the community? Or were there kind of different motivations that people had? Well, uh, Green Mountain Power, I think it's Green Mountain Power, had Salmon Hole. Mm. And they just felt like it wasn't being used. It was a really pretty place. There was barely a trail down to the river, but there were beautiful views. If somebody was managing it, it could become a park. So I didn't have to get a hold of them. They got a hold of me. And so that's the, sort of the next question, which is the, once somebody gives you a parcel of land, you have to maintain it and make it work for humans and animals, right? From what you said. So what is, how much does it cost? I mean, is that an expensive undertaking? And then who pays for it? Do the towns pay for it? How does the war economics, what do you do for management and how do you support it in that district? Um, we would minimally manage it, it, minimally develop it. So the trails were put in very particular places that would leave, if people stayed on the trail, they wouldn't be infringing on them what we considered to be the best wildlife habitat. And um, we had simple footpaths, but they were the path of least resistance and people stayed on them pretty freaking well. Um, and what was the other part of your question? Oh, the towns. Yeah, how do you pay for it? Well, we were very good at getting grants. Mm -hmm. And it, they invariably required a local share, the Land Warner Conservation Fund, Browsing, Vermont Housing and Conservation Fund. And that's where some of the people would um, sell it to it, us at a bargain price. So the difference was what could be called the local share. Um, and it just, the towns, when you have seven towns, usually there's one that's more resistant to paying and then others just are delighted to pay. But everybody came through over all those years. Yeah. So uh, talking about reading the landscape, when you look at Chittenden County now compared to 40 years ago when you started the district, the landscape has changed so much. What are you thinking when you say that? Well, really, it's a question okay. for you. What do oh. you, no, I mean, I'm happy to answer it, but I really should have not, should have phrased it. Like, how do you see the landscape change? I mean, I see um, so much of South Burlington built on. I see the whole Tap Corner area. You know, we thought Pyramid Mall was gonna be some gigantic thing, and I don't think anyone imagined that, that those parcels were gonna get used in that way, and now it's, it encouraged sprawl. It, it's totally yeah. encouraged sprawl yeah. in a way that um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't. I wasn't involved in the planning. I've just observed it. So, but Chittenden County is quite large. It's not just those two places. And so, I wonder what you see and what do you think the state of the natural habitat of Chittenden County is today? I think it's it's pretty amazing how diverse it has stayed. And one of the reasons for that is that we have a top topographic feature that is very good for wildlife corridor routes and that is ravines. So we have these steep ravines that could even be, you know, just 50 feet away, the lip of the ravine, it's steep, and people could be walking along on a path next door, right n near it. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of ravines. So I think that has saved a lot of the wildlife from being just gone from this area. Burlington has some of the best diversity. And it's partly because it got settled because it was so gorgeous. Um, but with all this many more people, it still has diversity and a lot of it has to do with the ravines. For example, can you say where some of them are? They don't usually have names. Okay. 
But what neighborhoods? You know, that's what we, for funders, we can name ravines after them. That's a great idea. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, so where would you, where would I look for a ravine if I was walking along somewhere? Well, when you're driving along South uh, Shelburne Road, you can see ravines that they go under the road and out the other side. Mm -hmm. And they're steep. And nobody, there are no trails in it. They're not good for walking. Right. And so the animals travel those paths in between yeah. one natural area and another. Is that sort of the Yeah, idea? and to find mates and, yeah. Yeah. And then um, what about development? I mean, how have, ha, have we developed new housing with the natural world in mind, in your opinion? Well, I think that's what one of the challenges is, is in, until you shine a light on important topographic features and stuff like that, people aren't even inclined to think about it. It's just nature out there. Mm -hmm. Let's make it prettier. Yeah. Um, and so there have been some places where I've been very sad to see that um, the cliffs that are in between Williston and South Burlington were dynamited and those were bobcat caves facing south. It was a really wonderful bobcat place, and it's gone. Mm. So those things do happen. Do you think the towns and the cities are doing a good job overall in their management of natural areas? Oh, I think so. A lot is through their conservation commissions, mm -hmm. and that's, that's an advisory form of local government where people are saying, hey, we got to save this. Um, and then um, people like Sue Morse and Alicia Daniel also get people thinking about how they can affect change so that some of the important features are saved. And do you think that beyond the district and the conservation commissions that the planning commission decisions or pla you know, decisions to place development are being made in a mindful way to the natural world? Well, they'd be a lot better at it if the Agency of um, Natural Resources put it on their atlas maps where it was a feature in the legend. Oh, ravines. Ravines. Yeah. And then um, also, you know, when they, the animals get to the end of the ravine and are going to cross a road, we need signs to warn the, way, the um, motorists. Or underpasses. Or underpasses, if it can be big enough. Is that um, underpass on Route 7 in Charlotte, that Charlotte, you know, there's the big walk, the Charlotte walk. Oh, Goes see, from I haven't Fi traveled Philo. to Sherlock since COVID started. Oh my goodness, so there's a walk I'm from going Mount, there. Mount Philo all the way to Greenbush Road. Whoa! And it's the town trail, and it goes under Route 7. Very nice. What's the diameter of... It's a tunnel. It's not a car tunnel under Route 7. It's a per person bike size tunnel under Route 7. Even better. I mean, yeah, the wildlife will go through at night if there's a lot of people during the day. Yeah, and it's not heavily tra trafficked. Um, it goes through that Sherlock co-housing to, out to Greenbush Road. And the whole idea is it's supposed to go um, all the way maybe to the Rockefeller property, you know that property yeah. that's behind the Charlotte store? It's supposed to go all, anyway, it's supposed to. But it is a pretty remarkable walk and I can see how the value of an underpass would be important in that situation. Yeah. So you've got Route 7. And that's a high speed road. Yeah, there's a lot of smashed animals on that road. Now, yeah. where you live in the New North End, there's some beautiful properties that we don't want to tell everybody about, but we're going to talk about, which is um, Red, Red, um, the diocese property, and then Rock Point. Rock Point, that's it. Yep. And then the Arns property, which is kind of a new acquisition. Arms Forest. Yeah. Kind of. Is it? I mean, it's been there, I don't but know is it? How long? I remember talking to Ann Arms ages ago. Okay. And she. It hadn't happened yet, but I'm not sure. So that's got added on to Rock Point. Is that next to Rock Point? It's or is across it the um, bike path. On the other side? Yeah. And tell us about those places and why you love them. 
Well, then the other one near my home, just to throw in a third one, is Ethan Allen Park. I walked in it today. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's owned by the city and managed very well. And it has so many rare plants. You'd just think people would have trod on them and they'd be gone. But the rocky terrain really helps preserve them. And is that where the homestead is or on the other? That's on the other side of the Beltline. Got it. Yeah, with the, the, with the tower, mm -hmm. and then there's a lookout as well. That's a pretty park. Oh, and it has, a, in the spring, I love looking at the ephemeral wildflowers. Before the leaves come out on the trees, they're just dazzling. Well, also in the south end at Queen City Park. Yes. That's their, those flowers are remarkable. Oh, yeah, I go there. Incredible. Where they blanket large areas, too. Yeah, just beautiful. That's a wonderful park. I found it really amazing. My neighbor, Mary Gady, is a naturalist like you, hiker, knows everything, and a geographer. And so she takes me there to Queen oh, City Park, and she yes. points things out because I wouldn't know what, now I know better what to look for. But the first time, I had no idea what I was looking for. And she had the book, and she was telling me what they were. And it was a revelation. That whole, what you were talking about, it was such a powerful idea of reading the landscape yeah. and learning how to read nature. There's a great book, How to Read Nature. And the guy also wrote How to Read Water. And it's just fa it's fascinating because we're not raised to see the world in that way, no. really. Right? No. And the other thing that is so amazing, when you're reading the landscape, at least for me, it resets my brain. And I've talked to people, so many people about that, just saying, resets my brain, do you, what, does it do it to you? And they right away, yeah. they know what resets your brain means, because yeah. they experience it. Well, it calms your nervous system. Yeah. Let's start there. I mean, just start And it there. stops the little voice in the head, because you're looking at so many things. Yeah. And the chaos is nice. It's, there's an order to the chaos of nature. One of the things um, you mentioned was about dog walking in natural areas. Could you just say a little bit more about that? Because I go to the natural areas and my dog is not on a leash, and now I need to know why it should be on a leash. OK, well, um, how to start with this? I learned a lesson from my dog, Ava, years ago. Um, we would walk. I'd always have her on a leash because it was the rules and at the park district, of course, I've got to follow my own rules. And we would stay on, stay on trail and be leashed. And one day when we were on a part of the trail that we were familiar with, she stopped, sat down, and just put her nose in the air. And so I stopped and I watched her to see, I was just so puzzled. Usually she'd be ahead of me and pulling me along, but she wanted to stop. So um, I watched her for a while, and then she started to just quiver. And my first reaction was, she's scared of something. And then I went, no, of course not. It wouldn't be that, not here. And that's when I realized she was drinking in the aroma, probably, of wildlife. And when I looked around, I could see there was a cliff above us, and wildlife could be up there and out of sight. You know, five deer. And then down in the marshy area near us, all the reeds were so dense, wildlife could be there. So my, t my challenge to you is to try walking with your dog on a leash and not letting them, and staying on trail. Yeah. And going slower and slower and slower and see if she picks a place to stop. Mm -hmm. And is it damaging for the forest to be have a dog trampling around? No. It's more that it will spook the wildlife. Okay. Wildlife, their brains are so hardwired, they have very little options beyond fight and flight if they're upset. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing they is they crave predictability because then they can, with Relax. their hardwired brains, be, you know, shrug stuff off. But 
when you have unpredictable species such as us. Yeah, and dogs. And dogs. Yeah. It's just, they'll flee. Yeah. So in, in the years that you ran the park district and the 10 years that you have not but been a community activist, what kind of lessons have you learned or would you like to pass on to people about that you've gleaned from the work that you've done and the life that you've lived? Whoa, that's I a know. big one. That's a big one. Um, I think a lot of it is just standing in the paws of the, or the hooves of the wildlife, just realizing you gotta stay on a trail because we will start losing different mammals. And um, when you look at how useful the fox is, for instance, it preys on the mice that tend to be the carriers of Lyme disease. And they're just, in fox and other small mammals like bobcat, um, they get rid of the nuisance species like skunk. And if their populations go down, our lives are not as easy. Mm -hmm. So just um, what lessons did I learn to focus on the wildlife? Not so much on plants, but the wildlife, because people can get endeared, feel endearing about other mammals. Jennifer, tell us about the Stay Off the Moss campaign that you are waging in our community. Well, if it's okay, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna read it right here. It's one of my hopes for the future. It's a current project of mine. I started this project at Arms Forest in the new North End in Burlington during the early days of COVID when suddenly there were so many more people in the woods and my target audience was mountain bikers, people about the age of my son and younger. My goal was to ask them to stay off the moss and here's how I got them to stop and talk to me. When I'd see a mountain biker coming my way, I would say, can I ask you a question? And they would invariably stop these polite young, mostly men. And well, there was one that didn't stop, but he sped by and turned around and said, thank you. But otherwise everybody stopped, no exaggeration. And the question I then would pose to them is which plant do you think may be the most important in keeping arms forest biologically diverse and resilient? And almost invariably, they would look up at the tops of the trees. And I would say, try looking down. And some of them would guess at that point it was moss. I think they were just imagining it as a sponge, really. And that's when I'd ask them to take on the challenge of to stay off the moss, that it required more skills mountain biking, but would they do this, please? And so my hope for the future is that existing um, mountain bike clubs will start to spread the word on that idea of stay off the moss. And why is it important? It's because Vermont's having more droughts and moss can be critical. It holds a lot of water and releases it during droughts. And I saw that at Arms Forest. Other places were drying up. Arms Forest was robust. And the thing that was neatest about it is I'd come on a hot summer day and within six feet of entering the park, the temperatures were cool because of that moss. Amazing. Keep off the moss. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and there was one last memory. Yeah. I'm out there and two mountain bikers didn't stop, but they, but I'd already talked to them. I didn't realize that I had and they went, we're off the moss, both of them. <laughs> it was so good. No, that's good. Any, uh, anything else that you want to pass on? How about your hopes for the future? Oh. Well, my hopes for the future, um, top and center is the idea of 
ravines getting noticed more and put on that Agency of Natural Resources Atlas that in Act 250 when there's a subdivision, um, we ask the developer about setting aside a portion of a ravine and in by doing that, they can get a waiver on some of their impact fees. Um, and headwaters are really important too because at the high elevations they branch off. So we really have to have a map to kind of look at where it makes sense to have these interconnectedness. And then to put cameras down in the ravines to see which species are down there. And are these things that are happening or are these things that could not happen. in a comprehensive way, Got it. but they're but they're finding like the cameras. I think it's UVM maybe that came out of that, where they they're very helpful. Yeah, they're they're a good tool. And UVM has so much land. Yes, that is that's still natural. That buffers the highways and good the condos. Point. Yeah, there's some amazing parcels. And Centennial Wheel Woods is now having more housing. Pushed against it. Yeah, and that's just like, no. Yeah. That's a lovely property full of diversity. Well, we'll have to go in the spring. I'm going to go with you. You're going to show me flowers. And well, I got to confess, I don't know the names of all plants, but, but I know you'll who, see them. Well, I know who hangs out with who. Well, there you go. Yeah. And you can, you actually have an eye for them, which is good because. That's how we learn. And then I have a final question, which is for those of us, you know, so many of us live in Vermont because we love this place. How can people get involved in the conservation and preservation of the natural world? I think a first good step is to sit at one of their local conservation commission meetings and just see what they're up to and see whether they want to work with them on their existing projects or propose other projects to them. But that seems to be working very well. And then to um, take a class from Alicia or Sue. Mm -hmm. It's empowering and you can communicate better about what, take people on trips and in the woods and promote them. So Keeping Track is Sue's project, right? Yes. And then Alicia's. Sue Morse. Sue Morse. And then Alicia's is? The Vermont Master Naturalist Program. There you go. That would be good. We'll put that up. Awesome. Yeah, and they their classes are not exactly the same. There's overlap, yeah. but they're, the methodology is different. So it's very cool. And looking back to your first job out of college, you know, you were a biologist, not yet even a natural resources planner. Did you have any sort of vision for yourself that you've realized, or have you just kind of put one foot in front of the other? Like looking back at that person, how do you see her in her youth and her 20s and her ide idealism, and how would you describe her and you? My parents, if they said something four times, you knew it was a big deal. And they, they guided us on how to figure out if it was a good job. And one of the criteria, of five criteria, was make sure that you're doing something important that's helpful. So when I first thought about that, I thought, I got to help human babies. They're the most helpless. But then I realized it was wildlife. I should really work on that. They're the lowest in the chain. Yeah. Or so we think. Or so we think. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jennifer Ely, thank you so much for joining us and for talking with us. Biologist, natural resource planner, activist, community member, and delight. Thank you so much. Retired and retired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. Thanks for watching.